Alrighty. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to this edition of VMAX. Before we start, let me just remind everyone of the ground rules, which I've pasted in the chat window. Everyone's audio and video is is muted, and you Alrighty. cannot change. Okay. This. So, uh, welcome everyone to wow. this edition of VMAX. Um, hold on. My apologies, I have no idea what that <laughs> crazy sound was. All right, so uh, you will not be able to uh, unmute your, we will not unmute you without your prior consent. And then at the end, again, we'll have a 30 minute uh, session where we can do live questions uh, and answers during the talk. Um, while Simon's giving his talk, his co-author Chris Edmund is here. He'll be answering questions via the Q and A. Um, and I think that's it, the rest is in the chat window. So. Without further ado, we're very happy to have Simon Mangi and Chris Edmund here presenting their work on unbundling labor. Simon, you just have to unmute yourself. Myself. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, okay, let me put this full screen and let me get this guy out. Chris over here. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, so this paper is uh, joined with Chris. Alex Weinberg has been a been a fantastic RA on it as well. Um, so, in this paper, we want to try to provide a new understanding of how changes in within occupation wage inequality can occur in a uh, in a competitive uh, model of 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 of, of, of labor, um, and how uh, how these changes can occur due to uh, can occur due to changes in technology. Okay, so the paper is going to have two component, two main components, a data component and a theory component. I'll go through the data first. We're going to present two new facts. The first is going to be that within occupation, uh, residual wage inequality, which will show as kind of the largest component of, of, of wage inequality, um, has kind of have starkly differential trends for workers in low skill occupations and workers in high skill occupations. So it's gone up a lot for workers in high skill occupations. High skill occupation workers are getting paid less similarly over time, conditional and observables. And while for low school works in low school occupations, it's actually shrank, uh, which kind of goes against general trends in the economy. The works in low school occupations are getting paid more similarly. We're then going to document kind of what seems like a separate fact using ONET data. We're going to show that at the same time that there's a differential trend in the similarity of what we kind of think is the technical, technical requirements or skill inputs of, of different occupations. Going to show that here, high school occupations have become less similar to one another. They've become more different. Meanwhile, low skill occupations have become become more similar. Right. This would be like an easy way to explain the first fact. If the fact the first fact was about between occupation inequality, right? High school occupations have become more similar, getting paid more similarly. Low school occupations, uh, sorry, becoming more similar, getting paid more similarly. Right. But here, the fact is about within occupation inequality, and kind of we'll try to argue that the standard models of competitive labor markets that we have aren't really useful for trying to kind of link, link these facts together. So we're going to try to use, then we're going to try to do some theory. The theory is going to help us try to understand this differential trend in within occupation inequality by our comparative static, which is tightly informed by this, uh, by this second new fact regarding the similarity of occupations. We're going to extend um, some work by Rosen and Heckman and Schenkman uh, in, the, in, in the 80s. Um, it's going to, we're going to show it's going to be particularly useful for thinking about these, these facts together. And then we, and we, the main exercise is going to be a comparative static that kind of represents the second fact, and we'll get this first fact kind of out of that comparative static. And then we'll show how we can endogen the conditions that need, are required to endogenize this comparative static um, in terms of a choice of appropriate technologies. So we can get this to, both of these facts to emerge endogenously. Um, if I get time at the end of the talk, I'll then kind of show that uh, this kind of comparative static where we change around the relative skill bias and the similarities of different occupation skill inputs is useful for understanding other facts, which we kind of think point to a trend in low skill occupations in which you know, low skill occupation works in low skill occupations are becoming somewhat more substitutable with one another. So it used to be the case that there were high uh, experience premium in low school occupations, there were overtime premiums. There was also part-time penalties. If you work part-time, the wages were lower. Those seem to have been kind of completely flattened out. Doesn't matter if you've been working in a job for a long time or if you're doing some overtime, you get kind of paid similarly to everybody else. 
also in low school work, workers in low school occupations are kind of bouncing around occupations more frequently. We can kind of rationalize these within the, within this framework as well. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go through these facts relatively quickly and then spend most of the time on the theory. Okay, so the first fact, workers in low skill occupations are getting paid more similarly, workers in high skill occupations are getting paid less similarly. How are we going to do this? We're going to turn to the CPS. I'm going to split all the occupations, split three digit occupations in the CPS into two groups, low skill occupations and high skill occupations. I'm going to do this by ranking them by the fraction of individuals that have a college education, just split on median employment. And I'm going to kind of reclassify all of these occupations each year, but the results are robust to that. Then what I'm going to do in kind of rolling five-year windows is just run some log wage regressions. Actually, I'm going to regress log earnings on a bunch of observables, including hours. So we can kind of accommodate the fact that in high school occupations, wages tend to be convex in hours. Um, and we can strip out the residual. Again, I'm going to decompose that residual, its total variance into a piece, a piece which is coming from within occupations, and then a piece which is coming from between occupations. Okay, simple. Okay, so this is this is what this looks like. So again, in the, in the US, kind of the trends in inequality in general, the inequality is going up. So we think this is kind of like a new and interesting fact to show that for low skill occupations, at least the trend in residual inequality is actually going down. Right? So it's kind of starkly differential trends for uh, high skill and low skill occupations. So we have the total variance, the within occupation component, the between occupation components. There's kind of three takeaways. First, the within occupation inequality kind of swamps between occupation inequality. Well, this is kind of where all the skill premia are. Um, uh, so within occupation inequality is important, right? In terms of the change, low skill occupation workers are getting paid more similarly. Within occupation inequality is shrunk. It's gone up for high skill occupations. And the decomposition in the total variance of within occupation inequality for low skill workers and the increase for high school workers is mostly driven by this within occupation component rather than between occupations, okay? So this fact in the middle, this figure B, is what we're really interested in in, in, in trying to in trying to understand. This is robust to a bunch of stuff that we can talk about um, we can talk about later on. Okay, so fact B, the second fact, which at this point should be kind of disjointed from the first fact, is that low skill occupations have become more similar to one another, and high skill occupations have become more different. The way that we're going to show this is that we're going to go to the ONET data, which has you know data on uh, uh, you know on three-digit occupations, we have data on you know 250 plus attributes of those jobs. We're going to take, uh, we're going to pull the ONET data on occupations in, in two periods. Right? And as far as I know, this is kind of some of the only work which looks at kind of changes in the skill content of occupations over time in the ONET. We have enough data to do that. So we're going to split it up into two blocks: 2003 to 2009 and 2010 to 2018. You get this massive matrix of J occupations by K skills. We're going to shrink this thing down using dimension reduction techniques, and we're just going to follow the really nice approach by Lisa and Postel Vinay, which is great. We're going to shrink this down to a J by K star matrix. So as opposed to having 250 plus skills, we're going to have four skills. These are going to roughly correspond to the kind of non-routine cognitive, non-routine manual cognitive and, and skills from Asimoglu and Otter. Okay, we're then going to take the columns of these matri this matrix, which are the skill vectors, the rows of these matrix, which are the skill vectors for each occupation. And then we're going to kind of compute a distance measure between, uh, between these vectors of skill inputs. And we're going to follow the approach in this nice paper by Gathman and, Gathman and Schoenberg in, in Jolly. So consider I had, suppose I had two, uh, suppose I had just a two dimensional vector of skill. And I, and I can, how do I kind of interpret this distance? It's like we're taking the radial distance between these, between these two occupation skill vectors. So the maximal distance between occupations could be 90 degrees. If the two occupations kind of sit on top of each other, then the distance is zero degrees. Okay. So I have this matrix of skills. I can compute the distance between each of uh, between each skill vector, so between each occupation. And then what I'm going to do is compare the distribution of these distances in the pre in the earlier period and in the, in, the, in the second period. So this is what I get if I if I do that. So on the left, I'm plotting the results for low skill occupations. On the right, I'm plotting the results for high skill occupations. The solid line is the first period. The dashed line is the second period. On the x-axis, I'm plotting. I have the percentile of the distribution of these distances. So all of the distances between all of the occupations. And on the y-axis, I have this cosine distance. 
it has a minimum of zero and a maximum of, of 90. So for low skill occupations, right the way across the distribution, the distance between occupations has fallen. Falls at the median, falls at the 90th percentile, falls at the 10th percentile, okay? So right the way across the distribution, uh, 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 low skill occupations have become more similar, at least in terms of this measure of kind of the, the technical input um, required for the jobs. In terms of high skill occupations, they've become more different, right? This has shifted upwards uh, and it's shifted upwards almost routinely across the, across the entire distribution, okay? So these are our two facts. Within occupation, inequality has gone, uh, uh, has, we've had differential trends in occupation inequality and we've had differential trends in the similarity of jobs for low skill and high skill occupations. Low skill workers pay more similarly, jobs are more similar, opposite for high school occupations. Okay. So to fix ideas, as I go into the model, this is how I kind of want to, is how I kind of want to think about. I'm going to talk mostly about low skill occupations, but I can kind of do the opposite for high school occupations. So this is how I'm going to want to, want to fix ideas. So I'm going to think about like having a coffee shop and uh, think I'm a coffee shop. Output in a coffee shop is selling coffees to customers. You have two jobs, you've got to make coffees and you've got to do the cash register and you've got to sell and, uh, and sell uh, coffees to customers. Can I move this thing? Aha, fantastic. Okay, um, right. So you've got these two jobs and they both depend on, on, they both take in the same kind of vector of skills. They both require some say non-routine uh, cognitive uh, skills and some, sorry, some routine cognitive skills and some routine manual skills. The two jobs have some skill bias. The coffee machine, making copies requires more routine uh, manual skills. Running the cash register, serving customers requires some more you know, uh, routine cognitive skills, right? But they both require some or the other. The old school, so now I want to kind of think about these this, this coffee shop over time. In the early period, I have very different technologies. Right? The coffee machine requires lots of dexterous skills. The cash register is this clunky old thing that requires lots of numerical numerical ability. Right? And I think about my Starbucks now, I can think these technologies are more similar. Kind of the gradient of these skill, skill requirements uh, across skills within each of these technologies is kind of flattened out. Right? So as opposed to needing a lot of one, a little of the other, they're now kind of more similar. So what we want to understand is how does this relative skill bias of technologies across occupations determine wage inequality within occupation, right? And we're gonna operationalize a theory to, theory to do that. Okay, I'll come back to my coffee shop later on. Okay, so here's kind of an overview of how, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about, you know, the different sources of within occupation inequality in this model. So this is gonna be a general equilibrium environment. Um, individuals are gonna have, uh, there's gonna be a continuum of individuals I, and they're gonna have two skills. They can be endowed with two skills, skill A and skill B. There's going to be two occupations, right? And crucially, this number of occupations is a lot smaller than all the diversity of, of individual of individual skills. And maybe we can kind of come back later to kind of think about think about the comparison of this model to models where you might have a continuum of occupations, which would be like say Ilse Linden Labs job market paper. So we've got two occupations: the coffee machine running the cash register, and they have different skill intensities over these two skills. In equilibrium, the competitive equilibrium, competitive equilibrium wages that an individual I in occupation J receives are gonna depend on two factors, their skill endowments and the, the prices for those skills that they face in, that they face in equilibrium. Okay. And, the, and it's gonna be set up so that these prices are linear. This is gonna generate with some selection of individuals into each occupation, the variance of log wages within each occupation, which is my measure of within occupation inequality. All right, so in this model, within occupation inequality is gonna be determined by two forces. So the first is this distribution of skill endowments conditional on selection into occupation J. Um, and this is something which is present in a Roy model, which I'll talk a bit about later on. And then the second, which is the focus of this paper is the gradient of these occupation skill prices. So suppose I'm in, in, suppose in equilibrium, individuals in a particular occupation have a lot of skill A relative to skill B, and the price of skill A relative to skill B is large, right? If that price of skill A relative to skill B is large, and that's gonna blow up these skill differences into large within occupation inequality. If those skill prices are kind of flat, the price of skill A relative to skill B is, 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 is smaller, then that's gonna reduce within occupation inequality, right? Um, and that's what we're going to, that's kind of what we're going to be working with. Okay, so more detail on the, more detail uh, on the model. 
So I've got a continuum of workers indexed by I, and they're going to be endowed with these two skills. I'm going to index by K, I said A and B. These things are going to be drawn from a distribution that's not going to have any mass points, um, discrete mass points, and that's going to be useful. That's going to be really useful for us in terms of characterizing the solution as problem. A final good is going to be produced using the output of uh, two different occupations. This could also be utility. I'll probably refer to it as utility at some point. I'm going to call it U. Okay. These two different occupations are going to take uh, are, going to, uh, are going to take in kind of aggregate allocations of skills. So each occupation J in one and two is going to produce output using a production function that, you know, for illustrative purposes, we're going to assume here is, is, is CES. So it's going to take some uh, allocation of skill A and some allocation of skill B, and it's going to have some bias towards each skill. Okay. In terms of labeling, um, I'm going to assume that uh, occupation one is relatively biased towards skill A, and occupation two is relatively biased towards skill B. Okay. Occupation one, skill A, occupation two. Bias, bias towards skill B. Okay, so what are these aggregate allocations of, what are these uh, you know, uh, aggregate allocations of skills? So the aggregate allocation of skill A to occupation J, I'm just gonna add up all of the skill A of all of the individuals working in occupation, um, occupation J. Skill B, I'm gonna add up all of their skill B. This phi is, is an indicator which tells me whether individual I is, is, is allocated to occupation J or not. Um, and the same here. So what's the what's kind of the constraint which is going to bias all of the action in this paper, which we're kind of we're excited about and we think is really interesting. So the constraint here is is technological and it says that workers are bundles. It says that worker I must allocate their skill A and their skill B to the same task. They can't split up though they can't split up the bundle of their skills, allocate their skill A to occupation uh, one, which is hungry for a skill A, and potentially allocate their skill B to occupation two. Which is hungry for hungry for skill B. Okay, a model where you have a production function which depends on both of these skills and this kind of bundling it was kind of put forward by Mandelbrot. Rosen Rosen kind of elegantly sketched out some results for it, and Heckman and Schengman did some work on work on this as well. All right. You know, while these papers kind of study stylized partial equilibrium examples, you know, we're going to study this problem in general equilibrium. And we're going to kind of crucially assume enough smoothness in different places, in particular with the distribution of skills, such that we can do kind of some really standard economic analysis with it. We can solve the efficient allocation and characterize, in particular, we can solve the efficient allocation and characterize skill prices that occur, which are crucial for within occupation inequality, in terms of some of the objects which are going to fall out of the fall out of the planning problem. And it's going to allow us to maintain a bunch of tractability. Right? So kind of a spin-off of this paper is that it's going to help you understand, you know, some of these papers, which are kind of hard to understand as well. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to dive in and basically we're just going to try to solve the efficient allocation. And the aim here is really to characterize the skill prices and how they depend on, on, uh, on these relative skill biases of technologies uh, across occupations. Okay. So, you know, what's a planner going to do here? A planner is going to maximize, is going to choose the aggregate allocations of skills, uh, such as to, to maximize overall output um, from these two occupations and, and production of this production of this final good. It's going to do that subject to kind of the aggregate availability of each of these of each of these skills, and it's going to it's going to achieve this by allocating individuals uh, individuals to different occupations. It faces this bundling constraint for each. All of these individuals have to be uh, solid, allocated as bundles of skills, which means that if I'm sending an individual's, uh, you know, if this indicator is, is, is one for an individual, I'm sending them to occupation A, then I'm also going to bring across their skill. I'm going to also allocate their skill B to, if I'm allocating their skill A to occupation one, then I'm also going to be allocating their skill B to occupation one as well. Okay. So I'm going to define as by omega JK. Uh, the shadow price of these uh, uh, aggregate allocations of skills of skill gate skill uh, k to occupation j. Okay. So what's the planner going to do here? The planner is going to equate the is going to choose this allocation such as to equate the social marginal product of each skill in each occupation to the shadow price that the shadow price that the planner faces. Okay. 
So here I have you know, the marginal product of skill and occupation one weighted by its marginal utility equated to this, this, this equated to this shadow price. Okay. So um, you know, uh, okay. So what I want to do quickly is kind of like almost kind of step back from this problem a little bit and can, can consider a planner which would actually face this problem, but not facing any of these bundling constraints across individuals. Right, which is kind of the crux of our of the model. So suppose a planner can actually split up individual skills and allocate them to different occupations. Right. So suppose that the planner could actually just take the skill A, send it to occupation one, and potentially take the skill B and, and send it and send it to occupation two. If the planner could do that, then it's kind of clear that the planner would have enough margins of adjustment to choose the allocation such that these skill prices are equated for each skill, like skill A, across different across occupations. Okay. So I can, if I could split up skills, I could equate these skill prices across occupations. If the price of each skill was the same in each occupation, then there'd be no determinant pattern of sorting across occupations. And since every single worker in the economy is marginal, the price of skill A is the same in occupation one and two, the price of skill B is not the same in occupation one and two, there's no kind of rhyme or reason why you any, want to allocate any particular worker to any occupation, despite the fact you know, that they have these, you know, these endowment and skills. Okay, so that kind of tells us that this bundling of individuals is going to be crucial for getting patterns of skill prices such that workers are determinately sorted across occupations, which is going to allow us to even kind of talk about within occupation, uh, within occupation wage inequality. So we can kind of think about this, with that in mind, we can kind of think about this problem as a constrained version of a relaxed problem, where the relaxed problem is that you can choose, send, you can send your skill A potentially to occupation one, and then you could send your skill B potentially to occupation two. However, that kind of relaxed problem I just described would then be constrained by a continuum, an infinite, a, a continuum of person by person bundling constraints, which then kind of Add this restriction on top that your skill A allocation, skill B allocation have to be have to go to the same occupation. Okay, so we can think of this bundling problem concretely as an unconstrained problem with infinitely many additional an unconstrained problem with infinitely many uh, additional bundling constraints. This is a you know kind of a bit of a, a bit of an annoying problem to make progress on or to kind of gain intuition from. So in the key step in the paper is going to show that we can take this problem and represent it in a way where we can really do like some really simple analysis and get a lot of tractability in terms of you know, our kind of key task here, which is to uh, you know, show how these um, uh, skill prices within each occupation um, depend on technologies. Okay. So what we show in the paper is that you can replace this continuum of person by person bundling constraints by a single, by a single aggregate constraint that the planner faces. Right? And I'm gonna call this the aggregate bundling constraint. Okay. So what's the aggregate bundling constraint? So consider some uh, aggregate allocation of skill A to occupation one. Right? If I construct that allocation skill A to occupation one, I know that the workers that constitute that allocation come bundled along with a bunch of skill B. Right? What this constraint said, what this con constraint gives is what is the minimum amount of skill B that can be bundled along with uh, 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 this measure of skill A. And what's the maximum amount of skill B that can be bundled along with this measure, with this allocation of skill A? Okay. And the way that we construct this is the following. I'm just going to go through the minimum and the maximum as like a, a symmetric argument. So consider some mass of skill A uh, in occupation one. And I want to allocate the least amount of, I want to kind of ask what's the least amount of skill B which is consistent with that allocation of skill A. The way I'm going to I'd achieve that in terms of allocating workers across occupations is to line up all of the workers in terms of their relative skill endowments of so skill A relative to skill B. Right? Then what I do is I get the first guy who has the most skill A relative to skill B, I send him to occupation one. And I get the guy with the second highest ratio of skill A to skill B, I send him to occupation one. And so on and so on and so on down the line. And I keep on going until I get to some guy I star, at which point I have kind of my desired allocation of skill A to occupation one. And then I just go and just add up all of the skill B that comes along with these guys. These guys had the most, relatively most skill A, so the, in, in, in terms of the allocation, have the least skill B. Okay, that's going to allow me to construct this constraint for any amount of skill A. And by parallel argument, I can also construct the maximum amount of skill B that comes on uh, with that massive skill A by kind of taking the guys who have the, the lowest amount of skill A relative to skill B. 
under certain uh, uh, functional form assumptions about the distribution of skills, you know, because we don't have any mass points, we can actually write this thing down in closed form and, and get a function out of it, which is just continuously differentiable, which becomes, makes it great to stick into the plan problem. So if we let these skills be independent draws from a Frisch where theta is kind of controlling the, the, is the, is the, is the, the tail parameter. Um, so independent draws for each skill K, we can write this thing down in closed form. And I'm going to use this to, uh, to, to, to uh, use this particular functional form to make the figures as I kind of go, go along. OK, so I'm going to make, I'm going to you know, explain a bunch of stuff through some simple figures, which are going to look like Edgeworth boxes. So on the x-axis, I'm going to have the aggregate allocation of skill A to occupation 1. On the y-axis, the aggregate allocation of skill B to occupation 1. This is the aggregate endowment of skill A. This is the aggregate endowment of skill B. Given a particular allocation, whatever is left over is, 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 the, allocation to, to, uh, is the allocation to occupation 2. Okay. So this is what this feasible allocation looks like. It's this smooth lens throughout the, the set of the you know, kind of possible aggregate allocations if you could unbundle individuals. Okay. So I kind of have three points. So again, if I kind of place my if I place my uh, little red marker thing over here, and I can consider this allocation of skill A, the bundling constraint gives the minimum and the, the maximum amount of skill B that can be attained along with the allocation of skill A. This, is a, this represents a unique allocation of workers. To get to this point, uh, well, to get to this point, I've, again, I've, gotten, I've, I've taken the guy with the highest relative endowment of skill A relative skill B, the second highest, and so on and so forth, right, to kind of get to this uh, mass of skill A. If I were to consider an allocation interior to this lens, then there's infinitely many different ways that I can achieve this allocation, right? This allocation is not unique. Um, However, it still respects bund the bundling constraints of individual by individual. Right? So in all these cases, individu these individual bundling constraints are respected. Here, there's like an indeterminate allocation. There's many ways I can achieve this allocation. Here, there's a unique way. Okay. The second point is that the slope of this lens is exactly given by the relative skill endowment of the marginal guy that's being used to construct the lens at that point. It's exactly his relative endowment of, of here it's the relative endowment of skill B relative to skill A. Right. So here I'm constructing the lens with guys who have a lot of skill B relative to skill A. Here we've guys with a little with a lot of skill A relative to skill B, and the lens is relatively flat. We can prove that it's convex, um, you know, by simple arguments, and, it's con and, and again, it's like continuously differentiable. The third point is that you know I've used an argument based on which occupation kind of is hungry for which workers to kind of construct this. But the lens itself is independent of the technol of technology. That's just labeling. Right. So this is entirely driven by this is entirely determined by labor supply by the endowments of, of, of human capital across workers in the economy. If the distribution of endowments of human capital across the across workers in the economy is less diverse, right, then this lens is going to shrink. In the limit, if all of the workers have the same relative endowment of skills, this would just be a line, kind of like on a, on a, this would be just be a forty-five degree line. Conversely, if we have, if we kind of widen the variance of these distributions of these draws, we're going to get more diversity in the, the more diversity in the draws of human capital individuals. We can have more individuals in the economy who look like they're relatively highly endowed in one in one skill, and relatively less endowed in another skill. I kind of refer to those guys as specialists. If we have some more specialists, this feasible set kind of starts to starts to move out towards the corner of these boxes, and in the limit. If all of the if the individuals in the economy are kind of half of them are a zero and a one, and the other half are like a one and a zero in terms of skills, they need to fill out the space, which is an example I'll come to again later on. Okay. I'm going to keep the distribution of skills fixed here. You could imagine moving it around in other kind of counterfactuals, but I'm going to keep it fixed, and I'm going to be interested in understanding how different technologies affect uh, affect wages, keeping keeping this fixed. Okay. So this kind of specification of the problem allows me to write down the efficient allocation, the problem of the efficient allocation in a particularly simple way. Okay, the plan is still maximizing output, and all it has to worry about is choosing the aggregate allocation of, of skill A and skill B to occupation one. It has these aggregate feasibility constraints, which tell you how much skill uh, A is going to be in occupation two and how much skill B is going to be occupation two, and then subject to this bundling constraint. Here I've only written the lower lens of this bundle, of this constraint because I I know that you know this this one's not going to bind because occupation A is 
occupation one is kind of hungry for skill A relative to, has a, rel a skill bias towards skill A relative to skill B. Okay, so given that this is continuously differentiable, we can you know, stick a multiplier on it and just take first order condition. Okay, so this is the first order condition for skill A and the first order condition for skill B. Okay, so if we stare at this, it's kind of clear that there's two different types of allocations that could occur. Right? The first is where this constraint is slack. So if this constraint is slack, I get back the uh, kind of characterization of the efficient allocation that I described where the planner can actually split out the skills of each individual and, and, and move them into different occupations, right? That is the plan is able to equate the skill, pr the price of the shadow prices of skill A across occupations and the shadow prices of skill B across occupations, right? So this constraint is slack the allocate and the efficient allocation is, is, is the interior of this lens. As I said before, the interior of the lens is it has to be a case where uh, there's like an indeterminate allocation of workers across occupations. That makes sense in terms of the skill prices. If the skill prices are equalized for each skill across occupations, then there's no gain from reallocating any worker to, from one occupation to another, right? They're valued the same way in both. So here there's no, there's, there's indeterminate, that would be an allocation with indeterminate sorting. It's even hard to talk about within occupation inequality. Another, and the other allocation is one where this constraint is binding, right? So as the constraint binds, we get a wedge between these skill prices. Okay, so what's going on? So suppose I'm on this constraint, right? And, and, the, and the constraint binds. What's the bundling constraint doing? The bundling constraint is creating a short, a shortage of, well, the bundling constraint is creating a shortage of skill A in occupation one because there's all of this skill A that's bundled up with the guys who are, are working and who are allocated to occupation two, right? So on the cash register, I want more of these numer numerical skills, right? Because it's a, it's a technology which is really biased towards numerical skills, but there's all this numerical skills that's bundled in with the guys who are working on the coffee machine and not being used over there, right? At the same time in occupation two, there's an oversupply of skill A, right? Because you can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of enough of it to ship it over to occupation one. You're kind of stuck with all these numerical skills and these guys who are working on the coffee machine. Okay. So this bundling constraint, the fact that the individuals have to be allocated whole to each occupation is gonna generate a wedge in these skill prices and kind of prevent factor price equalization. So this is kind of, I, I still think this is really nice. It's a competitive, it gives you, it's a competitive model with no factor, without factor price equalization without any kind of frictional markets whatsoever. Okay, same thing's happening for skill B. So for skill B in occupation one, right, this is uh, uh, the, the, the skill which is, which is kind of the secondary skill in occupation one. Here, the bundling constraint is generating a surplus of that and a shortage in occupation B, right? And so this wedge is moving in the opposite direction. Okay. In the paper, we have key results, which is to show that you know this alloc this simplified problem has the same has achieves the same allocation as the the kind of the full problem with the continuum of constraints. Um, that problem doesn't doesn't give you this characterization of the wedges between skill prices, which we think is like particularly particularly useful. You know, but what this result says is that you know there's kind of no information lost by moving to this one single con one single constraint. Secondly, we decentralize this problem, which allows us to interpret the shadow prices of skills in the planners problem exactly as skill prices which occur in the competitive equilibrium, right? So now I'm just going to refer to these things as skill prices. Um, and we also show, we also prove that the, the wages are linear in skill prices, as I, as I showed before. We also have an example where we have these Rocher distributed skills, Cobb Douglas production technologies, and Cobb Douglas preferences sitting on top of everything. And then we can give closed form comparative statics for how this multiplier, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for when this multiplier binds and when it doesn't bind as depending on parameters of the model. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these two types of two types of allocations and I wanna move from thinking about differences in skill prices within for each skill, each skill across occupations to the differences in skill prices within each occupation, which are again, a, a key for what we're interested in here, which is within occupation inequality. So the first is this unbundled allocation where the, the, the constraint is slack. Okay, so now we've got this stuff in blue. The thick line in blue is, is the contract curve. It's the set of all the points where the marginal rates of technical substitution are equalized, uh, for, uh, equalized across occupations. Right? So the marginal rate of substitution of skill A relative to skill B are the same. 
that gives us kind of the Pareto set of, of possible allocations. Uh, the unbundled allocation that obtains along that curve is the one which equates the marginal rate of substitution across occupations to the marginal rate of transformation for each skill across each, each skill across occupations. Okay, and that's what pins down this, this equilibrium allocation. Okay. This allocation is interior. There's no determinant sorting. It's really hard to think about within occupation inequality. And the and the wages which support the support this competitive this allocation in the competitive equilibrium are such that the ratio of skill prices of skill A to skill B are the same uh, uh, are the same in both occupations. Okay, so this is the unbundled allocation. Um, our second allocation is the bundled allocation. So in the bundled allocation, this bundling constraint binds. Absent this bundle, abs absent this restriction on allocations presented by bundling, the competitive equilibrium allocation would be out here. Right? But here we have here we have this constraint. So when you kind of stare at this, you know, micro 101, you want to you, you want to allow really the agents to be able to trade uh, to trade such that you can move both occupations onto a higher isoquant right? um, and move kind of onto the contract curve. Here that's not possible because of these constrictions on because of these restrictions on bundling. Right? As the bundling, if the contract curve is further out, if this bundling constraint is tighter, if it's further in, this bundling constraint is 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 weaker. Okay. So as I described before, that bundling constraint is then opening up these wedges between skill between the price of skills across occupations. Okay. But it's also opening up wedges between the prices of skills within, within occupations. Okay. So here the allocation of individuals to each occupation is, is unique because we're on we're on we're on this lens. Okay. And the ratios of skill prices within each occupation that support this allocation in the competitive equilibrium are now different for each for a different within each occupation. Right? So what's going on with these skill prices within an occupation? Right? So as the bundling constraint binds, so the shadow price of the shadow value of skill A in occupation one increases, the shadow value of skill A in occupation two falls. Right? The shadow value of skill B in occupation one is falling as it's going up in occupation two. So these within these differences in skill prices within occupation uh, within skill across occupation open up a gradient of skill prices within the occupation. Right? Skill A is kind of artificially scarce in occupation one. Skill B is artificially like kind of over uh, uh, artificially abundant, right? And that's going to increase the relative price of skill A relative to skill B. Right? So the price of the primary skill relative to the secondary skill is increasing. Same thing's happening in occupation two. The price of the primary skill relative to the secondary skill is, is increasing. Okay. The, you know, once you substitute out the bundling, once you substitute out the, the multiplier on the bundling constraint, the equilibrium condition that pins down this allocation on, you know, the first order condition of the planning problem, you know, in addition to the constraint is, is intuitive, right? So consider increasing the allocation of skill A to occupation one. To increase the allocation of skill A to occupation one, the only way to do that is by moving an additional worker from occupation two into occupation one. This is the net output associated with that worker. This is their marginal product in, in terms of skill A. This is their marginal product in terms of skill B. How much skill B do they have? Well, that's given exactly by the slope of this lens, which is given, which is, which, which is, which is equal to their relative endowment of skill B relative to skill A. And then this is how I value that increase in production. This has to be equated to the, to the, to the loss in the, the loss of the, the utility of the lost output in, in occupation two. Okay. Okay, so this is like a, I want to say ding, 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 ding. This is like a bonus round. Um, so it turns out that you can kind of relabel this, you know, if you don't want to do labor and you just want to think about complete and incomplete markets, you can relabel this and interpret all of this in, in, an, in, a, in an incomplete markets economy. Okay, so here's a detour. I'm going to say I'm going to call this an incomplete markets allocation. Consider the following incomplete markets economy. You have two individuals. Those individuals have, have utility over consumption in state A and consumption in state B. Individual one's biased towards state A, individual two's biased towards state B. These guys don't have any arrow securities to trade. At date zero, the only thing that they can trade before the realization of which state's gonna occur is a, is a set of trees. And there's a continuum of trees. 
These trees have a payoff in state A and they have a payoff in state B. So in period two, the only thing that you can consume are your trees. Um, this particular incomplete markets economy can be exactly mapped into what, into what, we're, do, into what we're doing here. Right? In this incomplete markets economy, the competitive equilibrium will be one where the marginal rates of substitution of individuals across states aren't equalized. Right? Individual one has a higher rate of marginal, higher marginal rate of substitution equilibrium. Individual two has a lower rate of, 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 of a lower marginal rate of substitution. Individual A holds all of these trees. Individual B holds all of these trees uh, in, in equilibrium. Okay. So this is kind of, I think, like quite neat parallel. It'd be useful for understanding kind okay, of what's coming up. As opposed to in our case where you know the planner can't break open workers to get at the underlying skill content, the interpretation here is quite clean that the that with incomplete markets you can't break open these restrictive assets to get at the underlying error securities. Or you can't break them up into just a component which has a payoff in one state and not in the other. Um, this is particularly encouraging because I think you know in future work it means that we can lean a bit on some uh, on. You know, we, now that we've realized that this also can be mapped into an incomplete, uh, particularly, particularly incomplete markets model, which Pierre Olivier Wiles also kind of thought about as well, we can, it's encouraging, it means that we can potentially go back to some earlier papers in terms of that literature to try to kind of, I, to kind of get at the theoretical properties of the equilibrium in terms of the geometric relationship between the unconstrained, uh, uh, the unconstrained proto efficient allocation and then the constrained efficient allocation as well. So that's kind of useful. Okay, so uh, yeah, that was a detour and you know, bonus round for people who aren't answering emails at this point. Um, okay, so like back to the bundled allocation. Okay, so again, so in the bundled allocation, these wedges and skill prices open up within occupations and this is gonna be important for, for thinking about within occupation inequality. Okay, so again, the wages, skill prices times endowments for each individual, right? So suppose you're in this bundle allocation. The bundle allocation is strictly sorted. Occupation one is, is chosen in the competitive equilibrium by individuals with a high relative endowment of skill A relative to skill B. Right? In equilibrium, they have comparative advantage, comparative advantage in occupation one. In the unbundled allocation, they might have a high relative endowment of skill A relative to skill B, but it wouldn't even be right to say that they have a comparative advantage in occupation one uh, because they're being different across occupations. So then, you know, what happens in terms of inequality? Inequality is going to increase, given this allocation, inequality is going to increase in occupation one as the price of this primary skill relative to the secondary skill goes up. Okay. And that's going to be achieved when this bundling constraint binds more. It's going to decrease as the price of the primary to secondary skill decreases. Okay. So if you're a specialist in occupation one and the price of the primary skill to the secondary skill goes up, right, your wages are going to increase relative to your, your mate who's a generalist. You know, in the paper, we provide a closed form example under uh, you know, of this under, a, under another particular distribution of skills, which here is deterministic. You can kind of take a log linear approximation of the wages to compute in closed form the variance of log wages uh, in each occupation. And you can decompose it exactly into that bit which is coming from endowments and that bit which is coming from skill prices. Yeah, and now I'm going to try to try to understand how like this differs from kind of the paradigmatic ways that we uh, uh, you know kind of think about the pricing of labor in competitive labor markets with heterogeneous skills. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that is to kind of consider two limiting cases. So you know which we nest. So one is is what I'm going to call the Katz Murphy or you know, like the Tim Bergen model, and one is one is and the other is the Roy model. Okay. So what does Katz Murphy look like? So these are kind of, I think of you know, the main ways that people like think about you know, price setting of wages in static competitive equilibrium environments with skill heterogeneity and, 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 and potentially in sorting. Um, why aren't they particularly great for thinking about within occupation inequality? What are they missing? Like, why can't they talk about these skill prices? Okay. So in terms of the, the cat, so what's the Katz Murphy model? Katz Murphy, each occupation, here each occupation would be a CES. With low skill workers and high skill workers. Um, we have some low skill workers and you have some high skill workers. How do you nest that here? Well, you just can be right down the problem where you have two different individuals. A low skill worker only has low skills and has no high skills. A high skill worker has no low skills and only has high skills. Right? In this sense, you know, Katz and Murphy is, 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 can be thought of as a model where 
you have kind of this complete skill supply, complete in the sense of the incomplete markets example that I showed before. The skills are sufficient to span any kind of demand for skills, irrespective of the distribution, irrespective of the skill biases of different technologies, right? So I could have some uh, one sector which is very biased towards high skill, one sector which is very biased towards low skill. There's enough diversity in skills such that the price of each skill is going to be equalized across occupation. And so we're not going to get these within occupation differences in skill prices which reflect biases of different technologies. Okay, this is off the table. And the equilibrium is always, as the equilibrium is always unbundled. The other extreme is a Roy model, which we can think of as, as, as extreme factor bias. So each occupation, as opposed to using two skills in, in the production of, of, of the occupation good, only uses one skill. Occupation one only uses skill A. And skill A is the aggregate of all of those skill A's of individuals in occupation. There's a, individuals are allocated either to one occupation or another. So in the Roy model, individuals, this bundling constraint still binds. Individuals are, are bundles. But there's only one of their skills is priced in each occupation. Right? If you're working on the cash register, it's only numerical skills. All the other skills are redundant. Right? Um, in, in, in our model, uh, in our model, there's still some small weight on those other skills. And the marginal productivity of those other skills is going to increase as, as those other skills kind of go to, go to zero. Okay. So what is, what's the implication of the Roy model for wages? Well, the wage is just going to be your endowment of that skill times the price of that skill. Right? So the price of skill A in occupation one or the price of skill B in occupation two. So if I think about the variance of log wages within an occupation, these skill prices just disappear into a fixed effect in logs, right? So if I, if there's any change in the economy that filters down into these skill prices isn't going to have any effect for within occupation inequality. Okay. A version of the Roy model, which is often used in empirical work, is called is, is what people refer to as the generalized Roy model. So as opposed to the, you know just this skill, we kind of think of this skill as a composite of all these other observably observable skills of individuals, right? So you know, that's a model where I have some production function which maps some potentially long vector of skills, numerical ability, dexterous ability, et cetera, into kind of an, a, a level of task output. And then that's aggregated. Okay. In this model, however, there's, these skills aren't in a sense traded. There's no prices for any of these skills. There's technology coefficients that might be different, right? but still there's only one price for the skill. And still that thing's going to be, there's one price per occupation, and that thing's still going to be observed absorbed into a fixed effect in terms of like a, a variance of log wages. Right? So both of these kind of canonical frameworks for thinking about determination of wages in these competitive labor markets, both are really hard to think about within occupation in, within occupation inequality as being affected by these, by these skill prices. Okay. This is what these look like in pictures. This is Katz and Murphy. You know, skill supply is complete in that everyone, if people are either a specialist at low skill or they're a specialist at high skill. Equilibrium is unbundled and there's no determinate sorting, right? And this is the Roy model. Each occupation only takes in one input. Isoquants are vertical, you know, and the bundling constraint always binds. You know, one nice thing in this paper is that, you know, we can, we can show that, you know, no one kind of solves the Roy model in the way that we've, we've done it with this bundling constraint and taking these first order conditions, but you can do it. And you'll actually find that if you do that, then this bundling multiplier still reflects the ratio of skill prices in, in the Roy model. So you can still kind of think about characterizing skill prices in the Roy model in terms of this multiplier. Okay, so I have an understanding of you know when this equilibrium is bundled, when it's unbundled, and and the role of this bundling on 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 failure to equate skill prices within across occupations, and then that effect on within occupation skill differences. So I'm going to kind of do this main comparative static exercise, which is informed by those empirical results. So I'm going to kind of think of I should have said this before. I'm going to kind of think of two economies, one where I have two low skill occupations, and then I'm going to do a separate exercise where I have an economy where I think of two high skill occupations. In the economy with two low skill occupations, I'm going to change the skill biases to make those occupations more similar. In the high skill, I'm going to change the occupations, the skill biases to make them more different. Okay. This is a rich framework for thinking about um, comparative statics. We can think about task bias, skill bias, or task skill bias technical change. In general equilibrium, any change in one occupation is going to filter down into the skill prices and within occupation inequality in every other in other occupation, which again is something that doesn't happen even in the generalized, even in the generalized Roy model. 
Okay, so I'm going to increase, I'm going to be moving around these skill biases uh, symmetrically, right, to kind of make the occupations more different or less different as per our empirical results. Okay, so here I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of showing the equilibrium as I make these occupations more, less and more similar. So I'm going to think of starting off at, at a point where these occupations are symmetric. And the occupations are symmetric, then you know, the diversity of skills which exists is always enough to, to lead to an unbundled out, unbundled allocate, is always enough to lead to an unbundled allocation. Those occupations can become more different. And despite becoming more different, be becoming more different, more kind of bias, skill bias in like different directions, there's still enough diversity in skills in the economy to achieve an unbundled allocation, right? So it's like you're endogenously achieving a complete markets allocation with the limited set of, of, of the limited set of kind of bundled assets available and absent something like arrow securities. Right? That's kind of the parallel thing thinking about incomplete markets. As the occupations become less similar, at some point the bundling constraint binds, the allocation stops moving around and we are on the on this bundling constraint. And as the occupations become more different, this bundling constraint binds and binds. Here I'm plotting this gradient of skill prices within each occupation. Right? So I'm plotting the log, uh, the log ratio of the price of skill A relative to skill B in occupation one, price of skill B relative to skill A in occupation two. In the, in the, well, in the unbundled allocation, these prices are exactly the same. Part of that owes to, uh, part of that owes to, owes to symmetry. What's really going on is we're tying down the price of skill A across occupations and we're tying down the price of skill B across occupations. Right? Everything's symmetric here, so these are just exactly the same. As the bundling constraint binds, the price of skill A in occupation one goes up and falls in occupation two and vice versa for skill B, which opens up this gradient of skill prices in occupation one. Okay, then the question is, the next step is, what does this do to wages? Okay. So here I'm plotting the relative wages of individuals relative to the relative to the mean within relative to their within occupation mean. I'm lining up individuals in terms of X, which I didn't define, which is their relative skill A to skill B. It's their kind of measure of comparative advantage. These guys are the guys are getting sorted to occupation one. These guys are the guys who are getting sorted to occupation two. So in the in the un, in the bundled allocation, the guys who are specialists are, are going to receive higher wages. Right, they're they're endowed in with this vector of skills, which is in particular short supply because of bundling, and so they're going to earn they, they they have a higher uh, social market, social value and they have a higher wage. The guys who are generalists have lower wages. In the unbundled allocation, kind of as the skill bias flattens out, then this gradient this gradient within occupation uh, skill prices also flattens out, which reduces the wage wages of the guys who are specialists and increases the wages of the guys who are generalists. I really want to get there, but when I kind of try to think about this in terms of the experience premium, I think of these guys who are highly specialized, you know, if you just add a bit of learning by doing to the model, but where you're learning by doing and kind of in the direction of the skill bias of your technology, then you can think of these guys as the guys who have been hammering away on the coffee machine for 20 years, right? They've been hammering away on the coffee machine for 20 years. They started off, they flipped a coin, worked on the coffee machine. Now they're super specialized on the coffee machine. You take the coffee machine, you turn the coffee machine into the Starbucks coffee machine. You turn the cash register into the Starbucks cash register. These guys who have been working and are highly specialized on, on highly specialized in terms of these skills, their inframarginal rents get eroded, right? Uh, as, as, as the equilibrium endogenously unbundles, right? Their equilibrium rents get eroded and they become indifferent over whether they work on the coffee machine or whether they work on the, on the cash register despite being highly specialized, right? And that's how I kind of think of the model as interpreting these additional facts, which are kind of speaking to the substitutability of workers in low-skill occupations. Okay, putting this together, what happens to the distribution of wages? I think I swapped the colors here. So this is the, uh, 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 in, the, in, the in the unbundled allocation within occupation inequality is smaller and the bundled allocate, in the bundled allocation and occupation inequality is wider, right? Okay. So, you know, this is how I, going back to my coffee shop, when I think about these two different machines, I look at them and I think, well, these are, the, each of these machines is particularly biased towards, these have very different patterns of skill bias. The equilibrium is bundled and sorted, right? When you go to that cafe, you see the same person working on the coffee machine every day, you see the same person working on the cash register every day. Um, 
uh, within occupation inequality is high, as the guys who are specialized are earning these high inframarginal rents. These inframarginal rents get, uh, get dissipated as these technologies become more similar. The skill bias of the technologies kind of flattens out. You move to this kind of unbundled, unsorted equilibrium and within occupation inequality falls. In the last five minutes, I'm going to try to understand under what conditions do these changes in factor intensities uh, emerge endogenously from an expansion in the set of available technologies. Right? The Starbucks coffee machines weren't available at some point in time. When they become available, are they adopted? And uh, you know, are they adopted? You know, are they adopted and when? Well, they are adopted because they're here. I have photos of them. Um, but you know, the question is, 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 are they in equilibrium in the model? Okay. So to do that, I'm going to extend the model. Um, under what conditions these changes in factor intensities emerge endogenously from an expansion set of technologies? The first thing I'm going to do is add additional factor intensities into the production function. So the production function is going to be augmented, where I have some, some factor augmenting productivities A, uh, A, A for skill A, and A, B for skill B. Um, right? And so we can kind of think of this thing as, you know, I'm working on the coffee machine. You know, this is again the, the numerical skills or the dexterous skills. Um, you know, maybe it's particularly maybe it's particularly heavy on it's, it's particularly biased towards dexterous skills. I might want to kind of in, augment the augment the dexterous skills of my. I might kind of put a put a bit of computerization into the machine so that the the productivity of a worker that has low dexterous skills on the machine is is kind of high is higher. And so as we kind of think of these factor augmenting um, of uh, uh, coefficients. Okay. Firms are going to choose. Firms are going to take as given skill prices. They're going to be profit maximizing, and doing so, they're going to minimize marginal. To do so, they're going to minimize their marginal cost, and they're going to do that by choosing these technology coefficients subject to a frontier, right? which is going to give us a set of a set of technologies. And I'm going to kind of start off at a particular point and then expand this set of technologies. Okay. So I'm still assuming that there's some innate factor bias. Right, associated with each task. So the coffee machine still, no matter what it's going to use, it's going to be dexterous bias, and the cash register is going to be saying numerical bias. Okay. So how am I going to think of this, this, this constraint? We're kind of taking this from you know, using some work by Caselli and Coleman to kind of help us characterize this. So in my example, I'm going to consider an initial, uh, an initial period where this constraint is essentially Leontia. Uh, this parameter rho, which is governing the curvature, the, the RCC of substitution along this, of, 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 along this constraint is, is, is infinity. So you know, the optimal skill, the optimal coefficients are just one and one. So we just have these initial technologies. And then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna reduce, uh, re reduce this parameter rho, which is gonna increase the set of technologies which are available. So what's the, how's the competitive equilibrium constructed? You know, taking skill prices as given, firms are gonna choose their appropriate technology while facing these skill prices. And then given these adopted technologies, we can solve the equilibrium exactly the same way as I described, described before. Okay. So as an example, I'm gonna have some innate skill bias. In the short run, I said, this is Leontief. In the long run, I have the full set of technologies available. Um, and again, this production function is, is CES with the answer is sigma. So what's the result here? The result is that if skills are substitutes, then endogenously, we'll find that the equilibrium bundles. Firms are going to choose technologies which look more like Roy, more Roy looking. And that's kind of, that's going to, as it, that's going to create, that's going to force the bundling constraint to bind more. That's going to generate within occupation inequality, which is similar to what we see in high school occupations. If skills are complements, then the equilibrium can endogenously unbundle, which is, and lower in, in a, within occupation inequality, work is going to be different over, over where they work. Which we're going to think of as consistent with what's going on with low-skill occupations. Okay, so bundling labor, right? We kind of start off in this in, in this in initial equilibrium. Skills are substitutes, right? So when skills are substitutes, what you're going to want to do when you, you get the opportunity to choose this technology is kind of double down on the factor in which you're already skill biased, right? So you're endogenously going to choose a technology from this set of available technologies, which is more which is more ROI, right? This seems kind of counterintuitive that you'd want to actually that you'd want to make this constraint more binding, um, right? But nonetheless, you kind of, because these skills are substitutes, you want to kind of choose technology which backs away from the, from the, from, from the, from, from the skills to which your, your occupation is not biased, right? 
In equilibrium, you don't go all the way to a ROI technology, but you choose a technology which is where the bundling constraint is binder, but is bind is more binding, right? The within occupation gradient at skill prices increases and becomes steeper, and the distribution of relative wages fans out, and within occupation inequality increases. And this is how we think of like the experience of high skill occupations. For low skill occupations, this can unbundle. Right? So you actually move away from the corner and you choose a technology which kind of ensures the weak links in your production function. And so if you're kind of biased towards skill A, when skills are complements, you want to ensure the, the, ensure the machine against shortfalls in, in, in skill B. So when the skills are complements, the equilibrium kind of endogenously unbundles, right? We get to a point where there's kind of workers are indifferent across different occupations and within occupation inequality falls. All right, so in this paper, we have these two new facts, very differential, very different trends for low skill occupations and high skill occupations in the economy in terms of how similarly workers are getting paid within occupations, right? And how similarly workers are getting paid for other attributes as well, which we can maybe discuss afterwards. High school occupations are getting more similar, low, uh, less similar low school occupations are getting less different. And we managed to link this to within occupation inequality through this, through this theoretical apparatus. In the paper, we can kind of, we had a participation decision, which might be useful for thinking about how when participation costs fall, what might be the optimal response in, to, for firms in terms of how they might change their technology. So if you have a lot of generalists, say, generalists entering the labor force, how might technology respond? And we can show the, show the efficiency properties of, 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 of the economy with the participation decision as well. Right? And in the paper, we kind of working more on going into this. Okay, I think that's... Wonderful, that was great. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, so as usual, we're gonna open up the floor to questions. So if you have a question you wanna ask, please feel encouraged to do so via the raise your hand option. Um, in the meantime, I guess I'll ask my questions while people are getting their thoughts together. Um, so first is just a clarification question. Um, can you just describe how you define high and low skill and whether, and that, that's like a fixed definition starting. In, in, yeah, in the empirics. So yeah. um, I've, always, I've still got my screen sharing, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. So in the, so in the empirics, we split them up by, I kind of went over this pretty quickly. So we take all the three digital occupations in the CPS um, and then we compute um, uh, the fraction of, uh, in a given year, um, we compute the fraction of individuals that have uh, a college degree in each occupation. Mm -hmm. And then we just split on the, we split on the employment weighted median. So, and in the empirics, which I showed you, we, we kind of redo this every single year and then run our regressions pooled in like five year um, subsamples. But this results for us to whether we kind of classify all the occupations in 1980 and then fix them and then do the exercise or whether we classify them all in like 2010 and, and do the exercise. Um, in terms of like the, uh, in terms of the, the codes that we use for the occupations, we kind of have to like harmonize the CPS across time. And to do that, we use codes from uh, David Deming who's done kind of work on, on the skill attributes of, of, of different jobs over time. Gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, because I was, well, one, I was wondering whether yeah, if it mattered, um, if you just fixed it in the beginning, because yeah, so if you fix it, like yeah. how, how you think about like this, because I guess you have this distribution H, which is like the distribution of the two skill types, um, and in your exercises, those are like when you do the comparative statics, those are the same over time. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're right. So we're you know, if I were to do. If I were to try to do like a like a serious quantitative exercise, which I think, which we're not right now, um, you know, you could kind of ask, uh, you know, keeping the distribution of skills fixed, you know, how much of um, within occupation inequality can be explained by kind of the changes in the um, the relative skill biases technologies that we'd infer from this like second exercise. Right. Okay. Um, so um, yeah. we have a question from the audience. Jose, I'm gonna unmute you. Just unmute yourself, please, as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so by using the CPS and doing these pooled samples, you kind of don't 
have a sense of who's coming in and who's coming out these occupations in comparison to if you use panel data. Have you tried anything like that? Because I'm just curious how these trends would look um, over time if you in control for who's moving into these occupations. Um, that's, I mean, I guess we are taking account of who's moving in and out of the occupations to the extent that we're, um, to the extent that we are running these regressions in like five-year rolling windows. So, you know, I'd be kind of concerned if, so like if I was just to run this regression on the pool sample from like 1970 to 2018, and then take the residuals and kind of plot the time series of the variance of the residual from that pool regression, then I'd be missing the fact that both the composition of workers was changing across time, as you, as you, as you pointed out, and that there's, you know, different things going on uh, with, uh, uh, you know, different going, different things going on with, with um, the, the gender gap in terms of pay, in terms of the firm size premium, in terms of the, of, of what's reflecting race, education, and industry of fixed effects as well. And so we're kind of controlling for both like the composition across these different things and kind of the prices associated with these precisely by trying to do it in these like rolling windows of five years. Um, I mean, I think like we could, um, I mean, I, I, I mean, one thing you could do is try to keep the people constant by looking at something like the NLSY, but then you kind of capture a lot of, then you're going to be kind of capturing just life cycle features. Um. Okay, so we have another question from the audience. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Great. Andrew. Hey, hey, Sam. Th thanks. This is really interesting. Um, so, you know, the, another kind of approach to uh, modeling um, skill bundling at the firm level is 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 um, Lazier's 2009 JPE paper, which models um, um, firm specific human capital as a model as, as an issue of skill bundling. And yeah. I, I was wondering if you can kind of comment on on how you're thinking about that paper relative to yours, because you're yeah. taking a very different approach here. You, you're assuming mm -hmm. that bundling happens at the occupation level and then all dispersion um, in outcomes within this, this kind of within occupation dispersion seems to come just from differences in skill endowments, mm -hmm. as opposed to something like you know, differences in, you know, dispersion in, in the value of firm specific human capital yeah. within yeah. an occupation. Yeah. So another yeah. approach yeah. to think about. So on the kind of, the, yeah. so kind so of like just, on the, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, no, I guess the, just asking, you know, why you decided to approach it that way, as opposed to think about that dispersion coming from more weight on firm specificity rather than occupation specificity at the high end. Um, so I mean, I guess here it is, like here the here the uh, right. I mean, here the bundling isn't really at the occupation level. What I'm doing is like in these comparative stacks exercises, I'm just saying like I can say work, low skill workers are competing in this labor market. There's you know there's kind of two low skill occupations, and then I'm just completely segmenting off the model and thinking about high skill occupations like complete completely separately. Um, I think that's kind of an I think that's an okay thing to do to kind of like think about this comparative static exercise. But the bundling here is at the level of the individual, right? So that I can't split out their they can't split out their skills. Um, in terms of the firm, you know, one pleasant feature of this isn't how we label things, but one pleasant feature of the model, you know, kind of the step of showing that the competitive equilibrium is efficient means that you could actually kind of solve this problem in terms of a firm facing a distribution of human capital that's workers and deciding which machines to, to allocate them to, right? Which is kind of a little bit of the disconnect of the example I use. The example I use would be more like a, a manager figuring out who's going to go on the coffee machine, who's going to go on the cash register. So I kind of need a better example, right? But given that the competitive equilibrium is efficient, I can equivalently think of a manager as assigning these workers to, to, to different tasks. So the level of the firm is that these individuals have to be kind of used on one machine or another, right? A question you might then have might then have is, well, can I kind of convexify the set of alternatives by having a worker work sometime on one machine and sometime yep. on the other other machine, right? But here you never want to do that. You either want them to use all of their time on one machine, or they want to use all their time on the other machine. Right? 
Where that would kind of break down would be if you were to say that while you work on the coffee machine, you kind of wear down some of one skill and you're left with, you know, your leftover, uh, you're, left, you're left with some of your other skill. Um, right? So you can go out and drive your Uber, you use up some of your staying awake skills and driving skills, and then you can still come home and you, know, you can still go to work and be a chef. Right? And you, you, you kind of have an undepleted reservoir of whatever skill that occupation uses. Um, so it's kind of like there's a one way of kind of thinking this, I mean, this is Gregor's terms, I'm sure. There's like a, a, a Rosen indivisibility, which is this bundling. And there's almost like this Rogerson indivisibility as well. It's like how I can yeah. kind of think of using these skills uh, o o over time. Um, in terms of the relation to Lazier, so, so in Lazier's framework, you have a, potentially you have a continuum of different uh, uh, skill weights on the two different skills in the production function. And then you have a continuum of heterogeneity amongst the, amongst the workers as well. Crucially, what that model has, which this model doesn't, is that model set in a frictional environment. So that gets the mismatch of, that has all this mismatch of workers and firms exactly driven by, by, search, by, driven by search friction. So that's kind of more like, um, so the, the paper I referenced, the Lee and Postel Vene paper, has kind of two dimensional heterogeneity of workers, two dimensional heterogeneity of firms. Those form a match and produce some output. And the search frictions are what's kind of leading to the alloc is, is going to lead to like uh, uh, you know, heterogeneity and heterogeneity in, in heterogeneity in wages. So if you take Lazier's model and you take the frictions out, or you take uh, Lease and Fossil Binet and you take the frictions out, you have like a continuum of heterogeneous firms, continuum of heterogeneous workers, and then you're actually back down to Ilsa Linden Labs job market paper, where you'd have kind of one-to-one -one matching. Where each worker is uniquely matched with a firm, right? And that model, it's like there's no notion of a worker being inframarginal, which is what's driving this within occupation inequality here, right? Um, uh, all workers are kind of all workers are marginal. Um, so kind of the key here is that you have the key here is that you have kind of lots of diversity of the individuals, and then there's limited diversity of firms, and it's in a, in a, like a competitive setting. Uh, just, Sorry, that was a really long answer. Just, just quick follow-up, just to summarize. I, I want to talk about all that stuff. Though. Oh, just, just, just to, you know, uh, do you think you a, a frictional model like Lazier's could give you similar results? I mean, you know, why do you prefer this? It's just in a, a short clip. Yeah, I think you, I, I, I haven't, uh, I've like written it down and thought about it, uh, and but I haven't, I haven't kind of simulated it. Um, it might be the case that you do get something out of that. I think this is like kind of clean and, you know, especially the fact that you can kind of nest these kind of other um, kind of, you know, example, you know, you know, really commonly used empirical labor frameworks and kind of point out exactly what those things are, what those things are missing um, without having to resort to a frictional model. Um, you know, um, I've been in Chicago for like two years and I'm, you know, giving up on frictional models and just doing it all with competitive models now. <laughs> Cool. Thank you so much. Cheers, Andrew. Uh, okay, so next we have Anna Figueroa. I'm going to unmute you. Just unmute yourself as well. Hi. Sorry, I wanted to go back to the to the issue of uh, classification of high and low skill occupations. If you, yeah. yeah. My question is whether you have tried to use instead of using the employment of college graduates using the requirement in terms of education of each occupation has Barney Schoen and uh, Seibelberg use and whether your facts are what, what, what was that what was that what was that paper Anna yes it's called and under employment and the trickle down of unemployment so basically they use information on what the, what degree is required to do a given occupation and my issue I think you should try this or at least see, because it could be that you have a large share of graduates, college graduates doing occupations that actually do not require a college degree. Right. right? And then potentially you could have a reversal instead of having an increase in inequality in high skill occupations, you just have an increase in under unemployment. So you would actually have right. an increase in right. inequality in low skill occupations. So having college graduates doing low skill occupations in reversal. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. That's certainly something we can do. Um, 
I mean, I guess like I'm controlling for education here. So I'm pulling out, I'm pulling out the college premium. The, I'm pulling out kind of the time varying college premium in both the set of low okay. school occupations yeah. and, and the set of high school occupations. So that maybe gets added a bit, but um, yeah. I but also for the distance, it might be important, right? For the, for the fact of the... For the distance. Yeah, I mean, the distance, have, then, yeah, sorry. the distance depends on how I'm chopping up these occupations now. So it turns out if I, if I do this, I think your approach is, is, a, is a great idea, mm -hmm. as you suggested. If I do this by, by our, like, because I'm splitting on, I'm splitting at the median, whether this is kind of, okay. no. how, you know, I can move a bunch of occupations across them and the results are pretty much the same. So I can rank them by like fraction of routine skill or like, Fraction with high school education, or well, obviously, um, you know, and, and get like very, get like very similar results. Um, yeah, this is the thing that you guys use in your paper, which is a beautiful paper. Um, I think yeah. yes, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, that's what. So my idea was that if you have um, college graduates doing in in what you classify high skill occupations, right? Then potentially yeah. you also have an increase in the distance because you will have more occupations that are low skill and probably, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'd have to think about it a bit more, but I like this, is, yeah, I'll try to look at using this this uh, this index. That's a nice idea. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, for, uh, thanks for teaching me about this in your paper. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for like, yeah, thank you. Um. Okay, so uh, if there's there's no further questions at the moment from the audience, but if there's any more, please continue to feel free to use your hand. Um, so, oh, okay, here's a hand. Federico Rossi, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah so just a question on the model. Um, so I was curious um, in terms of what would happen in your model if instead of endogenizing the bias of technology, as you do, uh, you were to somehow endogenize the supply of skills. So having individuals yeah. choosing different bundles of skills. So would that be a force that act to complete the supply or, uh, or not? So how should I think about this? That's a great, que that's a great question. Um, I'm not completely sure of the efficiency properties, but I think if you're a planner, then you want to, uh, if I consider like this, bundled allocation, um, then you know you'd like you you'd like to you you'd like to complete the you'd like to complete the mark you'd like to complete the uh, uh, com complete this kind of space of skills by kind of having you know essentially creating arrow securities in, in these individuals um, by kind of reallocating some of if I could chop up the skills of individuals and reallocate someone say skill B to somebody else and someone skill A to somebody else. And I think I'd want to chop up individuals and turn them into, uh, 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 turn, them in, turn them all into specialists. Okay. And that's going to mean that there's going to be some winners and some losers. And right? so here, you know, when we do these changes, some people's wages fall, some people's wages, wages, wages increase, um, but overall output and, and uh, uh, increases. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Kevin Murphy's thesis actually thinks about kind of how the bias of technologies incentivizes specialization kind of puts in you know, it's either being a specialist or a generalist um, so you know if, the, if, if you're taking prices as given and they're very biased then you want to become a specialist if the price is really flat you want to become a, a generalist and then yeah the question of what happens in equilibrium i'm not sure um, That's a good question. And I think like one thing that's, um, yeah, no, I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, so we have some questions from the panelists now. Uh, so uh -huh. Tommaso, you can jump right in. Yes, hi Simon, great, great hey, talk. Um, just I guess like, and related to actually what, what you were talking about before uh, with Federico and, and Andy, um, so it seems actually there are like two parts of the question. Like it seems that uh, uh, there are like you know big values in to try to complete the, the skill supply, 
so first, like, you know, is there any way to kind of try to do like a back on the envelope to calculate how costly it is, uh, um, like from, you know, from the data? And then the second part, uh, uh, it is like, you know, do you think that maybe like uh, all these, like, you know, working from home revolution, uh, whether that actually could favor the, um, kind of like, you know, unpacking the initial, the initial constraint that skills have to be bundled. If you are like, you know, sitting in your desk, maybe it's easier to kind of, like, you know, supply one hour of time, one occupation, one hour of time to the other occupation and just like, you know, target the skills properly. So I wonder whether you, you know, you have some thoughts on this. So I guess like the second part, the second, the, the second part for us, like, again, you know, if you, if, um, if you, you, if you can spend, say, like half your time on one task and half your time on another task, and you get, you know, 0.5 of your wage on one task plus 0.5 of your wage on your other task, then you still want to spend all of your time working on one task right. here, right? So the question then is like, when you're doing the task, is it using both of those skills at the same time? And that's kind of like the crucial assumption here, right? So like, I can't like, yeah, make a copy and use my coffee skills and then write a paper and use my paper writing skills. Um, you know, I'm using, I'm using, I'm using those coffee skills when I'm trying to write a paper as well. Um, in terms of like the back of the envelope calculation, like the model so then, yeah. Can I give you like, just a little bit of pushback on that? Like I, I see it, but like, it seems that part of it, uh, part of the fact that you really have to use both skills it is because then you have to be like in the same location and you just have to like, you know, yeah, jump yeah. between, between one of the other, right? Uh, and so maybe yeah. actually uh, um, removing like, you know, the cost, like it, it's, it's a matter of interpretation somehow, um, but removing the cost to kind of like, you know, redirect your effort towards one occupation or the other um, may uh, yeah. make it easier to, to do that. I mean, there's anyway. a positive cost of, if it's, if it's somehow, if, it, if it's cheaper to work on two, if it's cheaper to split your time between two occupations, then maybe you'd want to do, do that. But that's like, but I'd imagine it's more costly to kind of swap back and forth between different things. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I, I, it's like a, I mean, I think, yeah, you, you really just want to be doing one task here. But yeah, you're right. The key assumption is that you're using both of these skills on each task. Like if it's not, then it's the Roy model. It's really hard to think about, you know, these skill prices operating within within an, within an occupation. Um, in terms of the back of the envelope, like the, the model presents like a really nice like back of the envelope calculation. We haven't done it, um, but you know, you could kind of characterize what it measures, which is to say, you know, how would the planner value a individual who has like zero units of one skill and one unit of, of the other skill? Right. Like, how would they value like an unbundled individual? Right. I think that's exactly related to the, the tightness of the tightness of this bundling constraint. Right. So, if you add an individual who's unbund, who who is like a, a, a who is like a zero and a one, I'm going to allocate them to one occupation. That's going to shift out this whole lens a little bit. It's going to slacken that bundling constraint. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you could potentially think of. You know, maybe it's the case that I could like outsource and buy some zero, zero one individuals from like another country or something like that. Um, in terms of the COVID stuff, um, so I don't know, I mean, this is kind of coming back to the other, the other point, but like, I do think there are implications of these trends for how we think about um, wages in like the post COVID world. Okay, so imagine you have like a staggered reopening of like low skill occupations. So you take all these low skill workers, you lay them off, and then you say, okay, we're going to open warehouses, then we're going to open like restaurants, then we're going to open these other occupations. Right? For low skill workers, if you're in this, if you if your kind of competitive equilibrium is unbundled, then workers are kind of indifferent across these occupations. The machines are relatively similar, like across all of them. So as soon as you open that first job, you're going to have a line out the door of people applying for it. Or it's going to create downwards pressure on wages, and then the next job, and then the next job, and then the next job. Right. So with that in mind, you really want to open up all of the low skill occupations at, occupations at the same time. For high skill occupations, you know, the dental technicians have you know, been laid off. The dental technicians go back to work. There's nobody else competing for their jobs because the, 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 those jobs are kind of becoming less similar over time. And right? kind of, you can think of workers as becoming more attached rather than less attached to these low skill occupation jobs. So that's why I think this is maybe like important for, uh, important for thinking about the labor market recovery from from COVID. Okay. Um, so I was, this is like an annoying technical question, but I was just curious because 
the solution that you've written down um, to solve the for the efficient allocation where you transform it into the single constraint. Yeah. Like, does that get crazy complicated if you go to three three uh, skills or like right. I guess the original problem is fine. Um, yeah. There must be some. So it it doesn't get crazy complicated if you go to um, three occupations, but um, skill three K. Yeah, but three skills gets complicated, right? So three skills, even in kind of a Roy model, gets really complicated um, because there's it's hard to kind of there's no natural ranking of right. workers across occupations. Yeah. Um, Asimoglu and Autor have kind of a, a very nice way of doing it with three skills in a very very particular way in a, in a paper of theirs. But generally, and it's a very special case, but generally it's kind of hard to do with, look at hard to do with three skills. But that's where you're kind of thinking about the link between this and the kind of incomplete markets model is maybe useful for us, right? Um, and certainly kind of, you might not be able to phrase it, you know, certainly you're probably gonna lose this characterization in terms of this like neat bundling constraint, right? But you can still potentially lean on the tools from this literature in terms of thinking about like the geometry of these solutions in where we have you know arbitrary amounts of occupations and arbitrary amounts of of, of, of skills right and that might be useful for like taking the limit of the amount of occupations or taking the limit of the amount of of, 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 of skills right? so kind of that we've just realized this i think is kind of encouraging of respect to being able to solve kind of harder versions of the problem or be able to say things like kind of more generally um, um, okay, so um, if there are no further questions in the audience, um, I think then we'll just be able to wrap up for now. So thank you, Simon and Chris, for joining us, especially at this very late hour in Australia. They're troopers. Thank you very much. Um, let me remind you all about the upcoming VMAX on uh, this coming Tuesday, which is going to be a very timely presentation by Dionysi Ali Prantis, Daniel Carroll, and Eric Young on the dynamics of racial wealth gaps. So I hope all of you can make it and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Laura. Bye.